Listen, for those of you who are new here, uh, my name is Will Franco. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Wheaton Bible Church, and it's a pleasure to be with you here this morning. And uh, this morning, we are continuing our series, our seven-week series, entitled By Faith, By Faith. And the reason why we have named this series By Faith is because in this series, we are going section by section and verse by verse through Hebrews chapter 11. Now, for those of you who are new to the Bible and don't know anything about Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is considered by many uh, to be the faith chapter. The faith chapter. And the reason why Hebrews chapter 11 is considered the faith chapter is because in Hebrews chapter 11, the author of Hebrews begins with a definition of of faith. He gives us a biblical definition of faith. And then for the rest of the chapter, he then proceeds to give us examples of that faith that are found in the Old Testament. And so this morning, we are in the fourth installment of this series entitled By Faith, and we are going to be looking at the life of Joseph, the life of Joseph. So here's how we're going to do it this morning. Um, If you know anything about Hebrews 11, there's actually only one verse concerning Joseph in Hebrews 11. What's fascinating, though, is that if you look back in the book of Genesis, there's more than 12 chapters about Joseph. So in Hebrews 11, there's one verse, and in Genesis, there are 12 chapters. And so what we see is that Joseph is hands down one of the most written about people uh, in Genesis in particular and in the Bible in general. And so the way we're going to do it this morning is I'm going to read the one verse that comes from Hebrews 11. And then as we go through the message, I'm going to read the corresponding Genesis passages as we get there. Does that make sense? Okay. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Hebrews chapter, chapter 11. And we're going to be in verse 22 of Hebrews chapter 11. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. And if you don't have a Bible, the passage is going to be here on the screen behind me. If you're new to the Bible, you don't know where Hebrews is, turn to the, go to the back of the Bible and go left and you'll find the book of Hebrews. Look for the big number 11 and the little number 22 and you will be with us. Okay, here's what it says in Hebrews 11 verse 22. It says, by faith, everyone say by faith. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. Now, one of the things that happened to me as I was studying the life of Joseph this week, one of the things that stood out to me was just how comprehensive the faith of Joseph was. And here's what I mean by comprehensive. One of the things that stood out to me is that the closer I looked at his life, I was blown away by the fact that that his faith was just so far-reaching. And so to put it another way, as I looked at the life of Joseph, by the time you get to the end of his story, there was literally not one area or one arena in his life where his faith hadn't impacted. His faith literally bled into every area and every arena of his life and had a significant impact on each one of those areas. Now, the reason why I believe that's significant for us this morning is because I believe that a lot of us, including myself, we have a very narrow and limited view of faith. For a lot of us, when we think of faith, we tend to only think of Sunday mornings and devotional times. That's essentially what faith uh, is in our mind. When When someone asks you, hey, how's your faith? You almost always default to your Sunday morning attendance and your time in prayer or reading the Bible. But what we're gonna see this morning as we look at the life of Joseph is that your faith should actually be way more comprehensive than what it currently is. And my prayer for us this morning, for you and for me, is that by the time we're done, we will see that your faith shouldn't just be impacting your Sunday mornings. Your faith shouldn't just be impacting your devotional times. But your faith should be impacting the way you parent. It should be impacting the way you do marriage. It should be impacting the way you date. It should be impacting the way you do singleness. It should be impacting the way you give time, talent, treasure. It should be impacting the way you look at the future. It should be impacting the way you look at the past. My hope for us this morning is that by the time we get to the end of this message, we will see that faith is much more comprehensive and much more far-reaching than many of us originally thought. Okay? So here's what we're going to do this morning. This morning we are going to look at the life of Joseph and we're going to look at his life under three headings. We're going to look at his life under three headings. There are three ways in which faith impacts Joseph. The first thing we see faith doing is faith defines him. Then the second thing we see faith doing is faith defends. And then the third thing we see is that faith depends. So it defines, it defends, and it depends. Okay? So let's begin with the first one. 
The first way that we see faith impacting the life of Joseph is we see his faith defining him. Defining him. Now, to illustrate that to you, um, if you, if you want to follow with me in your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 37. Now, in Genesis chapter 37, here's what's happening. Uh, it's actually where the story of Joseph begins. So if you're reading the book of Genesis, you don't hear anything about Joseph until Genesis chapter 37. When you arrive in Genesis chapter 37, you discover that Joseph was one of 12 brothers. That's a, that's a big family. We're talking about Duggar territory here, okay? He was one of 12 brothers brothers. And what we see is that his father, Jacob, his fa- in other words, his father was Jacob. Now here's why that's significant. Because if his father was Jacob, then that means that his great-grandfather was Abraham. And for those of you who know anything about the Bible, Abraham is the individual who God made his covenant promise to. He came to Abraham and he said, listen, I am going to bless you so that you might be a blessing. So, so essentially Abraham is the father of of faith. Abraham is the father of the, the Judy, Ju, Judaism. And so what we see is that Joseph is from a very prominent, well-known family. But listen, even though they were prominent and even though they were well-known, it doesn't mean they weren't messed up. This family was messed up. Like if you ever think your family has issues, just read that story and you'll be like, you know what, it wasn't as bad as what I thought. Okay. Like, like, I don't have time to get into how bad it was, but, but if you ever, it, just to summarize, it's like a combination of the, the, the TV show Sister Wives and uh, the Maury Povich show. It's like a combination of those two things. That, that's the summary of this family. That's how, that's how bad and dysfunctional this thing was, okay? But what we see, though, in, in the life of Joseph in Genesis 37 is that out of all the 12 brothers, it says that Joseph was his father's favorite child. Now, for those of you who are parents, you know that's not a good thing to have, right? And if you do have a favorite child, you don't tell them them that. You know what I mean? (laughs) You just keep it to yourself. The problem with Jacob, though, is that Jacob repeatedly showed the rest of the siblings that Joseph was his favorite son. And one of the ways that he does it in the story is he makes for him a multicolored robe that he gives to him as a gift, and that gift is a, is a, is a, is, it signifies his favoritism of his son. Now, if that wasn't already bad enough, what makes it even worse is that Joseph, instead of deflecting the attention, it seems as if Joseph did everything in his power to, to bask in the spotlight. And the more he did it, the more his siblings despised him. What we know from what commentators say is that he was about 17 years old when this was happening, so he wasn't that old yet. And so in his immaturity, instead of deflecting, he embraced his identity. And as a result, it caused division in his family. So now that you have a little bit of context, look at what happens here in Genesis 37. Verse 5 says, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Okay. You could have gotten the, 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 the idea then, maybe I should keep this to myself. But no, verse 6 says, he said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were, being, we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then you would think, he, okay, I, got, I, got the, I got the clue. I should keep this to myself. No, 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 no. He's not done yet. Verse 9. Then he had another dream. Brothers well, like Martin Luther King with all the dreams he's having, okay? Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So here's what we see, okay? Joseph is the favored son. He really can't do anything about that, right? That's his father's issue, not his. But, but the problem is, is that what we see here is that Joseph's vision was right, but his heart was wrong. Let me say that again. 
His vision was right because it was from God. But his heart was wrong because it was from his flesh. Okay? And so what happens to Joseph is he gets to a place where his primary and ultimate identity starts to come from the fact that he is his father's favored son. So he takes a good thing, his father's love, and he makes it a God thing. Instead of it describing him, it starts to define him. And that's when his issues begin. It no longer describes him, it starts to define him. Okay? Now, I don't have time to go into it, but in the next chapter, the very next, uh, not even the next chapter, it's in the same chapter, but in the very next passage is where his brothers have, get so fed up with the whole thing that they betray him and sell him into slavery. Now, here's the thing about that story. One of the things that we find out later on in Genesis 50 is that God had several macro reasons for why he was sold into slavery, right? That we don't find out until later on in the story. But one of the micro reasons for why God does what he does to Joseph is because God wanted Joseph to deal with his identity crisis. Joseph had an identity crisis. He had misidentified himself. And his primary and ultimate identity was coming from his earthly father instead of his heavenly father. And so even though we don't find out about the macro reasons until later, one of the micro reasons for why he goes through what he go through, goes through is because God is trying to shift his identity from his earthly father to his heavenly father. God was totally fine with that describing him, but he was not okay with it defining him. Listen, and the same thing that's true of Joseph is true of us. The longer you walk with God by faith, the more your faith should, becoming your, should be becoming your primary and ultimate identity. Now, here's the thing. I don't know everybody here in this room. But what I can tell you is this. Every single one of us is called to play different roles, multiple roles, in fact. Right? So maybe in this season of your life, you're called to be a student, or maybe you're called to be a spouse, or maybe you're called to singleness, or maybe you call, you're called to be an employee, or maybe you're called to be an employer, Maybe you're called to be a parent or a grandparent or a voter. Listen, regardless of what role you play, one of the things that you have to be aware of, one of the things that you have to be careful with is that if you're not vigilant, depending on your temperament, there are certain identities that can move from describing you to defining you. They go from being good things to being God things. Now, you might be sitting here this morning thinking, well, what's wrong with that? What, what if I find my uh, identity in my children? What if that is the identity that defines me? Well, what if I find my identity in my career? What, what's so wrong with that? Well, there's actually multiple things wrong with it, but I'm only going to give you three. Okay? The first danger that you have to navigate if you are finding your identity in something other than God, your primary identity in something other than God, is that if your identity is in something other than God, you are always susceptible to losing whatever that is. So follow with me here. The only identity in all of the universe that you, can, that you can have that will never be taken away from you is your faith in God. Every other identity can be stripped away from you. So for example, if you find your identity in being a spouse, you can lose your spouse. If you find your identity uh, in, 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 uh, in your children, you can lose a child. If you find your identity in your career, you can lose your career. Oh, this is a big one. If you find your identity in the ministry that you do, you can lose the ministry that you do. One of the things I always have to ask myself is, who am I if I'm not a pastor? Like, does my value come from what I do on Sundays or does it come from what Jesus did for me at the cross? Okay. So, so the, the, the danger is, is that if your identity, your primary identity is in something other than Jesus... That thing can be stripped away. You should never find your primary identity in something temporary, ever, ever, because it will eventually let you down. That's why Jesus says that, that the people who find their identity in him build their house on rock, and the people who find their identity in something else build their house on sand. Here's what's fascinating, though. When the sun is out and the clouds are pretty, you can't tell what you build in your house on. Both houses look exactly the same. Jesus says the only way you figure out what your house is built on, built on is when the storms come and when the winds blow. 
That's when you see what your primary identity actually is. So, so the first way, the first reason, the first danger, if you will, that you must be aware of if your identity is in something other than Jesus is that that thing can be taken away at any time. But the other danger that you have to be aware of is that not only can it be taken away at any time, but it's up to you to maintain that identity. It's up to you to keep it going. And what starts to happen if you're not careful is your, your, your value and your self-worth come from that particular area of your life instead of coming from Jesus. So here's the problem when that happens. Let's say your, 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 your primary identity comes from being a parent, right? Well, if your primary identity comes from being a parent and your child grows up to be a prodigal, then you're a failure no matter what. In your mind, you see yourself as a failure, even though you did nothing wrong, right? There's some of the best parents in the world have prodigals. But, because if that's your, but if that's your primary identity and your child didn't turn out the way they were supposed to, everything else in your life could be going great, but you're a failure because you failed in that area in your mind. If your primary identity is in your career and you get laid off, you're a failure. Your, wife, your, your family can be great. Your finances can be fine. You can be growing in your relationship with the Lord, but you don't really care what God says because God's not your God. Your job was. You didn't lose a job. You lost a religion. See? That's the danger that, 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 if, that if, if, if it's something other than God, then it's up to you to maintain it. Your self-worth and your value are wrapped up in what you do, not in what Jesus did. And, and that's why that's so dangerous. You know, one of the ways you can tell if you're finding your significance and something, other, your identity and significance in something other than Jesus, one of the ways you can tell is if, if, if when you succeed, it goes to your head, and when you fail, it goes to your heart. If when you succeed in an area, it goes to your head, and when you fail in an area, it goes to your heart, there's a good chance that's probably your primary identity. And so if your kids are walking with the Lord, you're walking around taking credit for it when really it was God that did it. Okay? So, so the first reason why it's dangerous to find your primary identity in anything other than Jesus is because you can lose it. The second reason is because it's up to you to keep it. But the third reason is because when you find your identity in something smaller than God, one of the things that starts to happen, sorry, my getting caught. One of the things that, that starts to happen is it actually affects how you view other people. When your primary identity is not found in God vertically, it starts to affect how you view people horizontally. Think about Joseph, right? When Joseph found his primary identity in being his father's favorite, favored son, all of a sudden, that was the lens by which he evaluated everybody else. And so since he was the superior one, they automatically became the inferior ones. The same thing is true with your identities. If, if your identity is found in, in um, how you vote, then anyone who votes different from you is inferior to you. They're the bad guys. Look at those sinners over there. If your identity is found in how you parent, if your primary identity is found in how you parent, then that's the lens by which you judge everyone else. Everyone either is either a better parent than you and it makes you go into despair, or they're a worse parent than you and makes you go into pride. So finding your identity in something other than Jesus causes you to look at others differently. It causes you to look at other people differently. But if your primary identity is in Jesus, then all you know is that you're a sinner saved by grace and that everyone else is a sinner saved by grace. So there's no judgment anymore because we're all on the same level playing field. Theologian Henry Nouwen, look how he puts it. He says, to the degree that we embrace the truth that our identity is not rooted in our success, power, or popularity, but in God's infinite love, to that degree can we let go of our need to judge. When I understand that my primary identity, identity is found in what Jesus did and not what, in what I do, I don't need to judge anybody else anymore because I am a sinner in need of grace and they are also sinners in need of grace. Does that make sense? So the first way that your faith should be affecting you is your faith should start to define you. Your faith should start to define you. Listen, God is totally fine with you having identities that describe you. But there's only one identity that should define you, and that's your faith in him. Okay? So the first way that our faith should affect us is it should define us. The second way that our faith should affect us is our faith starts to defend us. Our faith defends us. 
Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to illustrate this one, I want to move to Genesis 39. In Genesis 39, it's two chapters after the, 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 one I, the passage I read from before. In Genesis 39, you, you find this very uh, uh, unique season and story in the life of Joseph. So by this time, in Genesis 39, Joseph has already been betrayed and sold into slavery by his brothers. Okay? So he's in slavery, and one, the person who buys him is an Egyptian official named Potiphar. Potiphar was his name. And what we discover in Genesis 39 is that Joseph is at Potiphar's house and he's doing a wonderful job because the passage says that the Lord was with him. And so over time, what, God starts to, what, what Potiphar starts to do is he starts to give him more responsibility to, to Joseph because he trusts him so much. So literally everything is going great. And for a lot of people, you probably would think that's where his story ends. But here's why it didn't end there. Because there was one major problem. The problem was, was that Potiphar's wife was a cougar. 100% USDA approved cougar. Okay. And the passage says that she starts to pursue him. The passage says that, 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 that Joseph was a handsome, well-built man. So clearly he was Hispanic, but that's a whole other story. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but it says that he was a handsome, well-built man. And that uh, Potiphar's wife, a.k.a. Cougars Are Us, started to pursue him and make sexual advances on him. But what I want you to see as we read this part of his story, I want you to see the role that Joseph's faith plays in his defense against temptation. Okay, look what it says here in Genesis 39, verse 7. It says, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. He says, how he finishes, he says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? So here's what I need you to see. Joseph has gotten to a place in his life where the primary defense against temptation is his faith in God. He gives other reasons, so there's other defenses, but his primary defense against temptation is his faith in God. Look at the language he uses. This, 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 language, this, this phrase, wicked thing, is a very strong word there in the Hebrew. And the reason why he has such a strong view of sin is because he has a very strong view of God. The, the heights of God's holiness it reveals and exposes the depths of sin's vileness. And the primary reason why he's able to stand up against her advances is because of his faith in God. Faith is one of the primary reasons why he was able to defend himself against temptation. And listen, the same thing that's true of Joseph should also be true of us. The longer you walk with God, it's not going to happen initially, but, but the longer you walk with God, the more your faith in God should become the primary defense against temptation. Now, here's the thing. Maybe for you, your temptation isn't the one that he's dealing with. Right? Our temptations vary from person to person and from situation to situation. Some temptations are more seasonal and some are more lifelong. Right? Maybe your temptation is to overspend. Maybe your temptation is to overeat. Maybe your temptation is to overworry. Maybe your temptation is to overspeak. Maybe your temptation is to overwork. But, but regardless of what your temptation is, and like I said, they, they, in a room this big, there's, there's numerous examples of temptations, right? Regardless of what your temptation is, the answer is always the same. The primary defense against your temptation is your faith in God. Is your faith in God. In other words, the longer you walk with God, the more primary your faith should become in your defense against temptation. Now, it doesn't happen initially. Like if you're here and you're considering Christianity and walking with God, I can tell you from my own experience, I didn't, I didn't come to know Jesus until I was 18 years old. A few months later, I was in college and I was joining a frat. And I, for the first year and a half of college, I went crazy. 
And part of the reason why I, I struggled so much was because my faith was so new that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't my primary reason yet to fight against temptation. Jesus didn't mean enough to me yet. Now it is, but back then it wasn't. It took many years of walking with Jesus so that my faith eventually became the primary way in which I battled and was defended against temptation. Now here's something I want to make very clear, okay? I would argue that faith is the primary defense, but it's not the only defense, okay? Don't, don't hear me say it's the only defense. There are other defenses that we can use that help us fight against temptation. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you're here this morning and you're an individual who struggles with sexual sin, with pornography in particular. One of the things that I would do if, if, if I was counseling you, I would say, listen, you got to make sure that you find people that are going to hold you accountable. You should have relational defenses, not only should you have relational defenses, but you should also have technological defenses. You should have websites and filters and things that help you. There's nothing wrong with technological defenses. There's nothing wrong with relational defenses. Those things are great and they're necessary, but they are not enough. The reason why those things are not enough is because there's going to come a time where temptation is going to arise and neither technology nor people will be there. And the only thing that's going to help you stand against it will be your faith in God. And so even though... So, so what I'm arguing for is that you're, 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 you're in your walk with Jesus, your, uh, your, your primary defense should be your faith. It shouldn't be your only defense. It should be your primary defense. Okay? Now, Matthew Henry is this Puritan uh, who died a long, long time ago. And here's what he says about this relationship between faith and temptation. He says, we have no sufficient strength of our own. All our sufficiency is of what? God. Then he says, we should stir up ourselves to resist temptations. You would think, now before I read the rest of it, you would think he would say, you, you, you fight temptations by trying harder. You fight temptations by being legalistic and religious. That's not what he says. He says, we should stir up ourselves to resist temptations in a reliance upon God's all-sufficiency in the omnipotence of his might. He says that the ultimate way for us to fight against temptation is by admitting that we are not the ones who fight. But by giving it over to God and resting on his might and on his power and on his sufficiency. It's the only way. Okay? Faith shouldn't be your only line of defense, but it should always be your primary line of defense. So, let's go back to our three points. The first thing we see is that faith defines Second thing we see is that faith defends. And then the third thing we see is that faith depends. Now, now, what do I mean by faith depends? One of the things that starts to happen at the end of Joseph's life, in Genesis chapter 50 in particular, the last chapter of Genesis, one of the things that starts to happen is his faith goes from being just an aspect of his life to being his life. It goes from just being a part of his life to being his life. And he gets to a place where faith becomes the lens by which he evaluates everything. And one of the things that happens in Genesis chapter 50 that's just so significant is he's, so, so let me kind of speed, give you some context on where we are in the story. So last time we, we checked in with Joseph, he was, it was Genesis 39, he was in prison. Well, God has moved him in a series of God-orchestrated events. He's gone from a, a prison to a palace. And he finds himself as the second in command of all of Egypt. Right? What's crazy, though, is that all of Egypt goes through, not, all, just, not just Egypt, but all the known world in that day, they go through this major famine. And so all the world has to come to Egypt in order to get water and food and resources. Right? What's fascinating, though, is that one of the groups that comes to get food and water are the very brothers who betrayed him. And so the vision that he had back when he was 17 finally comes to fruition when he's in his 50s. And he's sitting there. They don't know it's him. He knows it's them, and he has all the power and all the authority and all the right to finally get his revenge. And so the question is, what does Joseph do when God finally puts him in that position, when the vision finally comes true? Look what it says in Genesis 50. It says, but Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is, being, what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. So one of the, the versions, this is probably the, the one that you most know, is where he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. So, so, so get this, Joseph is in the place where he can finally get revenge, where he can finally give him a piece of his mind, where he can finally even put him to death if he wanted to. And instead of doing that, Joseph forgives them. You know what I would argue? I would argue that the ultimate test of your faith is your ability to forgive somebody. I've never, in all my years of pastoral counseling, I would argue that the, the, the hardest thing for a Christian to do is to forgive when they've been betrayed. If you've been betrayed by a coworker or a family member or a spouse, it's hard. But one of the ultimate tests of your faith is your ability to forgive. What we see in Joseph is that even though he had every reason to bring judgment, he instead brings forgiveness. Why? Because faith, he, he had become so, as he, as he walked with God, he had become so dependent on faith that faith had now become the lens by which he evaluated everything. I would argue that the same thing that's true of Joseph should be true of us. We must get to a place in our walk with Jesus where faith is the only thing that gets us through the day. Where faith is, is our faith in God, our, our dependence in God is so strong that it becomes not just a part of our life, it becomes our life. See, one of the things that we see in this passage is that the reason why he is able to do what he does, uh, Joseph, is because he didn't have faith in himself. He didn't even have faith in faith. He had faith in God. So it wasn't the strength of his faith that got him through. It was the object of his faith that got him through. The reason why that's important for us to note is because we live in a world that loves faith. Our world loves the concept of faith. Just go on Twitter or, or watch a, a celebrity or whatever. You'll hear it all the time. Faith, we must have faith. We got to have faith. What's ridiculous, though, is that when you actually get to the bottom of it, what our culture is actually saying is that your faith should either be in yourself or your faith should be in faith. How ridiculous is that? How am I going to put my faith in faith? Faith has always been meant to be a means to an end, not an end in itself. And so even though our culture loves faith, it's almost always either faith in yourself or faith in faith. What we see, though, in his life is that the reason why he can do it is because he's dependent not on himself. He's dependent not on faith. He's dependent on God. And the longer you walk with God, the more true of you that should become. You should become more and more dependent on God. Here, here's how we usually view maturity. The way we view maturity in the world we live in is that we, be, we grow mature by becoming more and more independent. That's the, human's king, that's the world's kingdom, right? In God's kingdom... You grow in maturity by becoming more and more dependent. That's what your faith should be doing. And here's the thing. I would argue that you and I have a much greater reason, a much greater reason to worship God. We have a much greater reason than Joseph to depend on God. And the reason that we have that Joseph didn't have is that God has sent us the greater Joseph. God sent years, years, thousands of years after Joseph lived, God sent a greater Joseph. A greater Joseph who came from a greater father who had a greater favor, who one day received a greater betrayal. He was put in a greater position of power so that through that position of power, he might offer us a greater deliverance and forgiveness. Can I get an amen? Is that okay? That's crazy. That's, that's what we see, that he, he, he is the great, there is, there's a greater Joseph. Think about it. The first Joseph, the first Joseph, he left his father's house. The, the greater Joseph also left his father's house. The, the first Joseph was his father's favorite, favored son. The greater Joseph was also his father's favorite, favored son. The greater, the first Joseph was sold for silver. The first Joseph was sold for silver. The greater Joseph was also sold for silver. The first Joseph was betrayed, chained, and had his robe stripped from him. The greater Joseph was also betrayed, chained, and had his robe stripped from him. The, the, the first Joseph was, went from prison to a place of power, and he used that power 
to forgive those who betrayed him. The greater Joseph also went from prison to power and used that power to forgive those who betrayed him. Listen, you and I can learn from the first Joseph, but we must only lean on the greater Joseph. You and I can be instructed by the first Joseph, but we can only be inspired by the greater Joseph. Our faith can be fueled by the first Joseph, but it can only be ignited by the greater Joseph. Listen, this passage, this sermon, this Sunday isn't about the first Joseph. It's about the greater Joseph, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the greater Joseph. And listen, even though there are similarities between the two, here's why Jesus is greater. You see, because Joseph, he left his father's house, but unwillingly. Jesus left his father's house willingly. Joseph was unknowingly betrayed. Jesus was knowingly betrayed. Joseph gets put into a position of power. And the only people he's able to forgive were the people who betrayed him. Because he says, I'm not in the place of God. Jesus gets put in a position of power and he's able to forgive those who betrayed him and the rest of the world too because he is in the place of God. Joseph gets put in a place of power and the only thing he can provide is temporary bread and water. Jesus is put in a place of power and he can provide eternal bread. And water. Isn't that beautiful? That does something in you. Guys, we have a greater reason to depend on God. We have the ultimate reason to depend on God. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a person, and his name is Jesus, the greater Joseph. Listen, the greater Joseph, he came not just to be an ex- not just to bring an example, but to bring expiation. The the greater Joseph came not just to bring a model, but to bring mercy. The the greater Joseph came not just to give you steps to follow, but to give you a savior to believe in. The the greater Joseph came not just to give you a standard to achieve, but he came to give you a salvation in which to believe. The, The greater Joseph came not just to bring outward religion, but he came to bring inward renewal. Listen, to the degree, to the degree that you see Jesus giving up everything for you, to that, to that same degree, your faith in Jesus will become everything to you. To the degree that you see Jesus doing the ultimate work of faith, to that same degree, you will ultimately walk by faith. And to the degree that you see Jesus as the greater Joseph, to that same degree, you will become like the lesser Joseph. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we we come before you this morning and we thank you that this passage, this sermon, this service, this morning is not ultimately about us. It's about Jesus, the greater Joseph, who was defined by faith, who was defended by faith and depended on you by faith. Thank you for that reality. Thank you for that promise. Father, I ask you this morning that for the people here who have yet to place their faith in you, I pray that today would be the day that they place their faith in you. Faith isn't easy. We're not promised that. But what we are promised is that you will walk with us every step of the way. And for the people here who have already placed their faith in you, I pray that they would be strengthened in their faith and that that as they go out this week, they would realize that their faith impacts every area of their life, not just their Sunday mornings, not just their devotional time, but it affects everything that they do. Help us, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people say.